are here to continue our series about dangerous prayers. And we want to help you understand some things that we can pray that we believe are going to really make a difference. Now, if I'm transparently honest about praying, and maybe some of you are like this as well, I know that I tend to say a lot of eyes when I get to praying. You know, I would like Jesus, I need. Lord, I would want you to do. And sometimes it's not even for me. Like, Lord, I want you to bless them. You know, I'm, I'm asking on their behalf, but it's, it's a lot of eyes. Is anybody else here can, can be honest and say sometimes you find yourself praying more for stuff that you want? Um, and I can't say I pray normally unless I really have to focus. Like, you know, what does God really want? Jesus, what do you want? Like, am I praying what he desires? Am I praying, God, I want your will to be done? What would you like for me to do? How would you like for me to be? What would you like for me to change? I struggle sometimes with that. And I think it's not just me. And sometimes even it can be like, you can feel that it's been so long since you've heard from him for these reasons. Like, you know, man, I'm praying all the time and I, I need some answers. And sometimes, anybody ever had a place where you needed an answer? Like, I need an answer today, Jesus. You start getting desperate in your prayers. I'm just like, why is he not answering? I know he hears me because he's answered other things. He's done other things in the past. But what is happening in this instance? And today I want to introduce you all to a prayer that I believe can be of help. And I want to talk to you all about some things that I believe can change not just your life, but your relationship with God. And it's a very simple prayer that simply says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we find this prayer being prayed in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I want to read that passage to you so we'll know where we're coming from today. But in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, it says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare. Visions were quite uncommon, and one night Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God, and suddenly the Lord cried out, Samuel! Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli and said, here I am, did you call me? And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel! And Samuel got up and went to Eli and again says, here I am, did you call me? And Eli says, I didn't call you, my son. Go back to bed. Now, if any parents are in here and only by the second time, you're like, look now, I didn't call you the first time and I definitely didn't call you the second time. Stop waking me up. You had a moment where you're like, you make me get out of this bed. <laughs> you're not going to like what's going to happen after that. So now here's the crazy part. It says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli, and he says, here I am, did you call me? And I can imagine Eli is like really reaching for a stick, he's reaching for something to throw, and it dawns on him in this moment that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he says to Samuel, go and lay down again, and if someone calls, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and what I love, it says, and the Lord came again and called as before. I'm so glad that God will continue calling me, even when I'm missing it, even when I'm going the wrong direction, even when I don't know what it is he's trying to ask. He will keep calling me to what he desires. Amen. And Samuel finally, with some help, replies, speak. Your servant is listening. Skipping down to verse 19, it says, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. I want to start off by telling you something that I know to be true, and it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter if you feel you're in a desert spot, if you feel you're in a wilderness. According to this, at this time, God had not spoken to the Israelites in a long time. Visions were not common. His word was not regularly given. But regardless of where you are, I want you to know that God still speaks. He still talks. He still speaks. He still has something to say. 
He still has an opinion on your life. He still has something he would like to give you and let you know about where he is on what's happening with you. But here's the thing. Sometimes we get very caught up on how we would like to hear from God. We got personal preferences. We got ways we want God to operate. And can I tell you something? God sometimes really don't care about how you would like for him to operate. <laughs> He has a number of ways he speaks to us, so let's, let's walk through some of these to help us understand that he can speak through his word. He speaks through the Bible more formally. And there are people that scare me, y'all. Now look, I will have conversations with about near anybody, with about near anything. From a denominational standpoint, from a Christian standpoint, I will talk and listen. The only time I will 100% shut it down is when people who claim to be believers of God will walk up to me and try to tell me something that they now believe or that somebody has shown them, whether in person or spiritual, that does not line up with the Bible. Oh, I run from them people. Wait, what? You, you got a new revelation? Yeah, God sent me here to bring this new revelation. He's adding this to his word, brother. Well, first and foremost, you done made God a liar, apparently, because he told us not one jot or tittle of this word will pass away until I return. He also said, please make sure that you do not add or take away anything from what I put in this Bible. So when people walk up to me talking about they got a brand new revelation, I just start taking little steps like this. Like, <laughs> let, let me go ahead and move away from you a little bit. Because what you're saying doesn't line up with his word and what he's put there, he's not going to challenge you or call you to or tell you to go someplace that goes against what his word has says he wants. Amen. This is one way that he speaks. So I tell people like, stop saying you want to hear from God and you're not in his word. Come on, I'll say it one more time. Stop saying you want to hear from God, but you're not spending any time in his word. Amen. Amen. You want to hear from him, you got to go to where his word is. Yes. Yes. And I promise you, he can speak to you through that. And that's Amen. one of the methods. Yes. Let's talk about another way that God speaks. He speaks through other people. Yes. Now, I know some of us want angelic visitation. <laughs> he will speak through other people. And sometimes, sometimes it's not even the person you want to hear the word from. Y'all better quit shutting down some of this stuff. You want Jesus to speak. Speak, Lord, through whatever means you need to. And sometimes he will. So here's the thing. God will use pastors. He will use peers. He will use friends to give you encouragement, to provide you with something called wise counsel. What scares me for people is that they will make life changing decisions without seeking wise counsel. The Bible says that wisdom is found in a multitude of counselors. Surrounding yourself with people that you know hear from God so that you can do something else, the Bible says. Test the Spirit by the Spirit. Hey, I feel like God told me X. And when you go to like three or four folks that you know hear from God and they all like, that ain't what, that, he didn't tell me that that. You better slow down. Oh, I got a lot of Bible for y'all with this. The devil masquerades himself as an angel of light. What makes you think you can see so well that he can't blind you? Well, God told me. Yeah, God told you, but your pastor, your parents, your friends, everybody else around you that hear from Jesus at all, even the dog is looking at you wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and here you go but well, I'm going to do it anyway okay I'm, I'm being honest look you guys I've had to make some choices and make some decisions and they were big decisions I don't trust me that much I believe I hear from God yes and when I believe I hear from him you know what I do I walk straight to some other folks that I believe hear from him and I say I feel like God is telling me this can you pray about it and let me know what you see? Let me know what he says to you. Let me know if you feel a peace about this. Because what I can't afford to do is walk off this cliff and it was an angel of light masquerading itself as God. And I just stepped off into something that God is like, I didn't even tell you to go over there. 
Now you praying for salvation. <laughs> Falling off the cliff. Oh, Jesus, save me. And Jesus like, I can save you, but you weren't even supposed to be over here. We have to surround ourselves with people that can give us confirmations on God's word. God can speak to us through music. He does it here regularly. He can speak to us through poetry, through dance, through art. This is why all of it is appreciated. All of it. There are people who are using their gifts for everything but God, but when I tell you, he gave them that gift to bring him glory. It is not the gift that's the problem. It's how it's utilized. Come on. Come on. Alfonso, I missed you last week, brother. Thank you. Welcome back. You ain't got to apologize. I get excited when Alfonso, look, I know you're going to preach with me. Come on. I love it. I love it. I know that God can speak through preaching and he can, pre he can speak through teaching. That's why the fellowship of the believers is important. Why? It puts me in community with other people who can hear from God. And I'm able to hear from a pastor or from a loved one, someone who I trust and believe hears from God. And I'm able to hear what God may want from me. Y'all, look, half the time I get up here, I got what my notes say, and God give me some other stuff that I don't know where it came from, and it never fails. Somebody be like, that was for me. Jesus will make a special order just for you. But you have to be in community to receive that. You can't do it on your own. You need other people. God will speak to you through dreams and through visions. And we have some people here that God operates through that. He will talk to them through a dream. Amen. 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 And the thing that I know we all have access to is to hear from God through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that we know lives within us at the moment we accept Jesus for being who he really is. And the Holy Spirit will talk to you. He will share things with you. He will convict you. He will make you feel a little funny about certain decisions because he like, you can do it, but this is grieving me, so I'm going to grieve you while you did it. And you out there doing it, but you're like, I just don't feel quite right. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you, uh-uh, that don't represent me right now. And we have to learn to listen to that and learn to hear God's word speaking through all of these different things. Now, here's a question as you're praying. Have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, you don't hear from him the way you want to because you're doing all of the talking? Think about it. Have you ever been in a conversation with people that just will not stop talking? It's draining. You be... Excited at first, you know, they say some stuff, you try, it's like double dutch, you trying to get in, you like, okay, I, uh, 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 got slapped in the face with the rope two, three times, and now you're like, I don't even want to play no more. You're trying to talk because you want to share your side, but they ain't really not interested in your side because they're going to get all out what they want to say. I had a brother call me one time, and he swore he wanted to help me understand something, and I don't know, I, to this day, I don't even know what he was trying to talk about. Why? Because he talked for so long and he wouldn't let me talk, I put the phone down. <laughs> Y'all, I put the phone down and this is how I know you didn't really want to talk to me. I left for a good five minutes. I came back. He's still talking. Now, typically, y'all know in conversation, people be like, uh-huh, okay, yeah, I feel that. That sound good. He ain't heard none of that in five minutes. So obviously this conversation is not about me. You really don't want my opinion. You really don't want my thoughts. You really don't want to understand how I feel or where I'm at with this situation. Well, what if God feel the same way sometimes about our prayers? Come on. And you won't even let him get a word in, in, in. We have to understand that God wants to hear from us, yes. But more than that, we should want to hear from him. God, how do you feel about this? Here's my situation, God. I just want to listen. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts? How do you want me to handle this? Do we take the time in our prayers to really allow him to share his heart? Or are we doing all of the talking? Or do we find ourselves like Samuel was, and maybe you just don't recognize his voice yet? 
And you're saying God's not speaking to me, and God has been talking to you the whole entire time, but you just don't recognize what he's been saying because it's being drowned out by so many other voices. Your own, what Satan would want for you to do, friends, family, TV, radio, music. Y'all better be careful with this music y'all listening to. Can I pause for just a second? Here's what we found out about music. And God knows, I studied this stuff and it scared me to death. Your subconscious has zero defense against music. God created music the way he did and it's so crazy. And Satan was created as the musical machine to bring about worship in God's kingdom. So Satan's first thing he wants to do always is to pervert the things of God, to use them in a way that is not what God intended. And prom I promise you, he sees music as a way to your heart and to your mind. So what happens from a musical perspective, scientists have proven that any message laced with music, your subconscious receives. You can't hide it. You can't fight it. You can't lie and say, well, I'm just listening to the beat. You are, but your subconscious is receiving everything. Amen. Everything them folks are saying. Everything they're talking about doing. All the stuff that come in behind them. The stuff they've been doing in their life that they done put the voodoo on their on record, and now you listening to it as well. Just feeding it in. And your subconscious has zero defense against any of that. We have to be careful about what we feed ourselves. We have to be careful because while God can speak through a number of methods, Satan can too. And we have to be mindful of that. So we have to recognize his voice. Is what I'm listening to here lining up with his voice? Is it lining up right here with his word? Is the stuff that I'm doing, the things that I'm thinking on, the places that I'm going, is it lining up with what God would want from me? Now here's something that's really important that really stuck out to me in this passage. Samuel at this time, according to historians, is probably about 12, 13 years of age. Eli, who is obviously old enough to be going blind, has this interesting situation where God is not talking to him, he's talking to the boy. And see, if Eli was like some of us, he would have got insecure. He'd have got angry. Well, God, why are you talking to him? I'm the priest. Why don't you bring me the word? But Eli does something that I want to encourage us to do. Eli looks at the next generation and says, it is my job, it is my responsibility to make sure that you not only hear from God, but that you're able to hear from him for yourself. Y'all, we can't keep holding on to the reins of things. We can't keep keeping young people out of stuff. We can't keep acting like they're here to replace us. I got news for you. They are. If we do this right, if we do this well, they are supposed to replace us. How does the gospel keep going forward when you got people who are getting older and dying? They have to impart the word of God into the younger ones who have the energy. My God, they got the energy. We got some teenagers back here right now. Y'all know y'all got some energy. Come on, energy will get you in trouble. Samuel is getting up ready. Yes, you caught me. Yes, okay, yes, uh, I'm coming, yes. And Eli's like, boy, lay down. Because when you get old, it bothers you when people move around a lot. <laughs> Be still, what you doing? Stop, all the moving. Because young people got energy, but we who are older have wisdom. And what, I, what scares me about churches today is that I see the church of God, specifically when I look here in Lake County, I see churches getting older and older and older and older, and they are hoarding all of the wisdom. And we got young people out here with all the energy just being dumb and stupid because we don't come together. You got to talk about what happened. Stop looking at them as they're, like they are a threat to you. These folks is coming up on the scenes. Technology has changed. Opportunities are different. The internet actually works. It's no longer doo -doo -doo. 
dial up. Young folks come into the church with crazy good ideas and the old folks shut them down because they refuse to learn something new. The devil is a liar. This is how the devil fights the church. So he pits the church against each other from a generational standpoint and then from a cultural standpoint. And before you know it, you just old and segregated by yourself. That's not, not of God. That's not what God desires. So Eli imparts into Samuel so that Samuel can learn to hear from God on his own. Church, that has to be our goal. For every young person here, they are not somebody that's here to give you problems. Now, will they? Yes. (laughs) Do they? Yes. We are here to walk them through their problems. We're here to love on them. We're here to tell them the foolishness that we did. Yes, we did. Here's what I did. I know that's not going to work out for you. You want to know why? Because I did that twice. And then when they go do it anyway because they believe the third time will work for them, then you need to be next to them and be like, I told you not to do it, but let's figure this out. We got to be better. This one conversation sets up Samuel in chapter, 19, I mean, chapter 3, verse 19, and it says, And the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. But it started with Eli saying, I need to help you not just hear from God, but learn to respond to him. There was a gentleman that was a bit older than me, and there was a time where I was ready to move away. I was just done here in Illinois. Some of you know my testimony a bit of having to start like, completely over and I was just you know what the worst thing about starting over is when you starting over around people you know because they know what things was like and now they see you now one of the worst things is feeling that sense of pity uh, having people talk to you like you know they pity you and sometimes starting over can feel a lot better when you go someplace new because then shoot everybody's starting over when you go someplace new and nobody knows so I told God like I I feel like I want to get away, and I'm ready to. I had a cousin who was living in Oklahoma. I was ready to move out there with him and start a brand new life. And there was an older gentleman at my church at the time. Um, His name was Elder McBride, and this brother was a different brother. Um, Elder McBride was one of the people, you know how some people, I ain't talking about nobody in here, how some people who get old just be talking about stuff, and you be like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Your story didn't make no sense, and it had no start, no middle, or an end, but you've been here for 30 minutes. <laughs> he was also the candy man. He always had candy handing out the kids and the people and everybody else. It was like, okay, well, I get a piece of candy, but I'm going to run from you when you start talking. And that Sunday, I remember going to church and just really telling God, like, hey, you know what? I think this week I'm going to make this phone call, and I'm going to start figuring out what, what this next part of my life is going to look like. And I went to church that day, went through the sermon. Everything was great. I was getting ready to leave, and here came Elder McBride, and I ain't going to even lie to y'all. I got irritated seeing him come. Like, I was walking like, please let me. (laughs) Jay, can I talk to you? No! (laughs) That man hemmed me up in the corner, and before I knew it, he looked at me, and he was like, Jay, God wants me to tell you that he said he can bless you either way. I was confused for a second. Because I'm like, wait, because my mind had already half turned off when, like, okay, let him talk for five minutes and then make you escape. And I'm like, wait, what? He said, God is waiting on you to make a choice. God is saying that he can bless you where you, you go, but he can also bless you if you stay. But he needs you to make a decision. Maybe like handed me a piece of candy and walked off. I'm just like, wait. That word right then that did not come from the message on that Sunday. It didn't come through the praise team. It didn't come from the pastor. It didn't come from anybody with a prophetic gift that I was waiting or hoping to hear from. It came from the one person that I thought was suspect most of the time. (laughs) But it was so blatantly obvious that this was God in this moment, and that moment changed my life. At the time, he who had to be almost in his 70s was taking time with somebody who was young enough with the energy enough to make some bad choices. And he said, let me help you hear from God. 
and it changed the course of my life. I don't know if I would be here right now if it wasn't for that moment in time. And for him taking a moment to allow God to use him to speak into the life of a young person that had no clue 20 years later I'd be standing on the stage preaching a message here in Lake County. God can do anything. The second part of this prayer, not only do we know God will speak, it says, speak, Lord. Amen. Now, um, I want to have a little bit of definition practice here. That term, Lord, I think we throw that around real lightly. Like, do we actually understand what a Lord is? You know, yes, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord, I receive. Yes, Lord, I, I would love to do that. Jesus is my Lord. We talk about that. We use the word Lord. But do we know what it actually means? The definition of Lord is one having power and authority over others. A Lord is a ruler by hereditary right or preeminence. Jesus, the Son of God, by hereditary right, is our Lord. By preeminence, he comes from heaven. He comes from a place higher than us. He also deserves to be called Lord. And it says that a Lord is someone to whom service and obedience are due. Oh, that word due means something else. It means you owe it. It means it's expected. It means when he speaks, there's no conversation to be had if he's really your Lord. So here's my question, and I'm just going to tear this all the way up. There's no proper English involved, but is he is or is he ain't your Lord? Is he is or is he ain't? Because see, Jesus was real specific. Don't play around with me. I'm not here to mess around with lukewarm people. Jesus in the word of God, it says, I would rather that you be either hot or cold. Because if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus said, don't play with me. It's not complicated for him. He knows exactly what he wants, you. And he's not willing to just stand by and allow you to play games and sit on the fence with it. So when we ask that question, what I want to know is, does God really have power and authority over your life? When he speaks, do you actually do what he asks you to do? Is he really your Lord? Because, see, there's a difference between saying someone is in authority and treating them like they're in authority. So let me help you out. Anybody in here ever been in high school and had a substitute teacher? You knew you was going to have fun that day. <laughs> For all the wrong reasons. I remember... You would have them days, you come in, it'd be like a Tuesday, you mad because, you know, you can't stand that teacher. No way, because she actually wants you to do some work and pay attention and be quiet. All the stuff, you know, good teachers actually make you do. But as a teenager, you can't stand that. I'm not trying to come here to learn. And then that door opened. And this guy walk in and you be like, and he go to the front and write his name on the board, and you already know he done lost all credibility. When you write your name on the board at the beginning of class with high schoolers, we already know. We about to shut this whole thing down. He turns around and says, good morning, I am your substitute teacher. Now, folks who don't normally talk and even want no problems, they acting all the way up. Folks is throwing stuff, people is talking, folks are laughing, people are standing up and chasing folks around the room. Why? Because you have the authority, but we sure ain't going to treat you like it. Yeah, you here in a position, but you don't even know our names. You don't know how to tell us to get out the room. You don't know who to call for help. You don't have none of that. You a substitute. And who listens to a substitute? Well, I'm convinced that a lot of us see God as a substitute Lord. Jesus walk in the room and he tell you who he is and he lets you know his lesson plan for the day and we start turning on the boom box, we start putting our earphones in, we start throwing papers, we start moving around, we won't be still, we don't want to listen. Folks who don't normally want to have something to say, now I want to tell everybody what God is doing or saying and God is like, am I really your Lord? But see, if he's really your Lord, 
then your actions will line up with what would be expected of someone that you would give that title to. See, in Acts chapter 10, Peter did something that was absolutely crazy to me. God is talking to Peter and telling him, hey, I'm going to show you all these animals that I'm now making clean, and I want you to be able to eat these so that you can reach the Gentile nations. He shows Peter a vision of all these animals, and he tells Peter, jump up, kill these animals, and eat. And Peter says the craziest combination of two words that are in the whole Bible. No, Lord. How are you going to call me Lord and say no? What movie does that work in? What country does that happen in? No, Lord. Because see, someone that's really your Lord, if you're really a servant, if you're really dealing with something in that type of relationship, when they say, hey, go get my car and bring it here, no, Lord. Hey, in the morning, I really like my coffee to be done this way. I don't want to make sure it's on my desk. No, Lord. I need you to pick up my children and have them here for their game by 5.30 p.m. No, Lord. Who would do that? In the natural, that makes zero sense. That's how you get fired, which would be best case, and you go far, far enough back, that's how you get hung. A servant that won't work and that'll tell the Lord no finds himself out back buried to his throat. But we'll look at God, the ruler of this entire universe, who will make a request of us and we will say no, Lord. And if you can say no, then stop calling him Lord. Amen. You got to pick one or the other. You either got to say yes, Lord, or just no. Because if it really is God speaking, and he really is our Lord, then our response to his request is what will tell us if he is. We got to respond in a way that lets him know, God, you are my Lord, and I will respond in obedience as one should do in this type of relationship. See, we understand that Samuel and Saul both heard from God. Samuel did what God said, and the Bible says that he received the benefits of that. His words never failed. Saul heard from God and did what he wanted to do and lost his whole kingdom. We know that Cain and Abel both heard from God. God said, this is how I want you to give. And the Bible tells us that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice, and Cain did what he wanted to do. Cain's sacrifice was rejected. He ends up mad and angry. He actually kills Abel and ends up cursed for life. But they both heard from God. We know that Lot and his wife both heard from God in the same situation. Run out of this town and do not look back. Well, one listened. <laughs> and the wife was running and decided to just take a glance and turn into a pillar of salt. We know Isaiah and Jonah were both prophets of God who were given a word to take to specific people to explain God's heart on where they were. And one of them did it, and one of them ended up in a well for three and a half days. See, our actions show us if he's really Lord or not. You guys, look, I believe people's actions. Folks have lied to me so much throughout life, I, I don't believe half nothing, nobody tell me. Tell me whatever you want, then I'm going to watch you. Because your actions are going to tell me the real truth. You say you love me and your actions don't line up, I don't believe you love me. If you say you want to help me, but every time I need some help, you're never to, anywhere to be found, I believe you. God is looking at our actions. Yes, God. You're my Lord and Savior. Yes, I'll do anything for you. Well, that sounds good at the worship night. Mm -hmm. But then the next morning when he calls you to actually do something that costs you something, and now you're st 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 stuttering. <laughs> I can hear Jesus saying, no, keep that same energy you had last night. Amen. Where'd that go? I thought I, I was your Lord and Savior last night, right? Yeah. Yeah, keep this same energy. Yeah. Because God is looking at our actions. 
and our actions are what tell him, do we really see him as our Lord? I want you to listen to this last part as I'm coming to a close here. But the third thing and the third part of this prayer, so we know God will speak. Yes, we need to make the decision. Is he our Lord? Because when he speaks, now we got a decision to make. But if you are a real servant, then you understand that servants listen to obey. That's all the servant is here for. My job is to listen to my Lord, listen to my master, and obey what he ever, whatever he requests. Whatever he asked for of me is to carry that out and to carry it out as quickly and as efficiently as I possibly can. Now, I know we all in Lake County, so y'all had the same problems I have. You go to certain restaurants, you get certain type of service. Sonia and I went to a restaurant last week. We were so hungry. <laughs> but we found out we weren't that hungry. <laughs> we walked in the door. It's people. The place is not even full. Folks are sitting down eating. It's like five or six people eating. It's servers walking around everywhere. We stood at that front desk for like 12 minutes. I know y'all see me. Like, I ain't that black. I know you. I know I'm here. I was walking by, not even saying nothing, not even saying, like, we'll be right with you. Hi, you know, someone's coming. I'm going to go get somebody. Like, they literally like we not here. Sonia, who is, now look, y'all don't, my wife is petty, petty. Like, she do it on the quiet side, though. That's why I people don't know. <laughs> it's people behind us who are being ignored as well. She literally turns around, are we just invisible? Just, <laughs> did we just turn invisible, like, when we walked in here? <laughs> my wife is petty, man. <laughs> And of course, she's saying it loud enough for everybody to hear. <laughs> but if I'm looking at your service up front and I can't get through the door in your service bad, why would I expect your service to get better when I sit down? You go places and it take them 15 minutes to bring you water? Or you ask for a salad and 30 minutes later you ain't got it like they got to grow the lettuce? That's your sign to get up and go to a new restaurant. Because the service is bad. And your job is to serve me. That's why your establishment exists, is to be in service. So when you don't do what you were made to do, you can't reap the benefits that come with doing what you're called to do. Come on. So we're looking for a blessing, saints, children of God, Christians, people who want to be blessed. We're looking for the goodness of God, but we're refusing to do the things that he built us and made us to do to receive what he has for us. Good servants listen to obey. A good server is going to come in and they're going to sit you down and they're going to ask you for your drinks. The best servers don't even have notepads. They're just listening to you so intently. They got it in their mind. They go back there and place your order. They come back. Here's your water. Here's your drink. You ordered that salad. I got it out five minutes before you. They, they are on top of it. Your water glass don't ever be empty. They just be around the corner just showing up. Wow, here you go. You be like, I didn't even, where did you come from? <laughs> I don't even know how that happened. Good servers, when they start to get to know you, they put your order in when you come in the door. They can see what you want. They're like, oh, here you come. Okay, get this ready. Have this ready to go. Get that special lemonade that they like. Make sure you put that lime on the side the way they want it because a good server is paying attention to the wants and the needs of the person they're serving. When you are serving God the way that he desires you to, when you're in relationship and you're getting to know him and you're understanding his desires and you're understanding his preferences, you start doing things for him before he even asks. Because you know it's his heart. Good servants listen to obey. And on that special opportunity chance that you walk in, and that sandwich that you always order, you decide you want to do something a little different. And they done already brought it out and handed it to you. You're like, yeah, I don't really want that today. You know what a good server does? They pick that bad boy up and they say, how may I serve you today? 
They march that thing right back to the, the kitchen. They dump it. They don't have an attitude. They're not mad about it. They're not treating you funny because I did this for you and you don't seem to appreciate it. No. A good servant says, how may I serve you today? Because what you wanted yesterday, you might not want that today. What you asked me to do, God, yesterday, you may not ask me for today. And am I willing to turn and do something different because it's what God has on the menu for today? Some of y'all getting mad and you're getting angry at God and you're treating him like he's the problem. He's not the problem. He knows the beginning to the end. You are the problem because he's given you directions that will benefit your life and you got an attitude heading back to the kitchen. Y'all, we got to do better. Here's the thing. You're not dangerous if you only hear from God. This is not a dangerous prayer if you only hear from him. It's a dangerous prayer when you hear from him and do what he asks. Understand that disobedience, if you hear from God and then decide not to do what he asks, you put yourself in danger. God wants to bless you. He says, I want you to prosper even as your soul prospers. I want good things for you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace, plans for hope, plans for a future, plans for you to do what I say do so I can get you there, but you want to get there by yourself. On your own, making your own decisions against what God is asking you to do. That's not how this works. God wants to see you successful, but he needs you to do things the way that he has it set up. Set up. It's all a setup. God has already made you victorious. He's already put your blessing in place. Here's the thing. You don't know how to get to it. You just don't know how to get to it. So here comes the Holy Spirit as your spiritual GPS and you walking around looking for your blessing. It's like turn left. Turn right. Now, how stupid would I be if that thing said make a U-turn? This is what we do. Hey, turn right, and we go whatever direction we want to go. Why are you ignoring the Holy Spirit that's trying to get you to your blessing? Come on. We've got to understand this. Obeying God will change the way you think, change the way you behave, change the way you worship, change the way you act. It'll change the way you parent. It'll change the way you live. Because when we obey God, He's not just sending us off. Amen. No. When we obey God and we go in the directions he's called us to, God walks right with us. Amen. And he says, I don't care what comes your way. As long as you're on this journey with me, there is nothing that we can't handle together because God has got it already taken care of. Amen. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm not bad? No, because the Lord is with me. Amen. That's what you want. You want God to be with you. And that's why we see in 1 Samuel 3.19 where it says, As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. And everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. Another version of this verse says, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fail. Can anybody in here imagine what would your life look like if nothing you did ever failed? What if you were failure proof? Understand that that's what God desires. God desires to be with you and to make everything you do reliable so that nothing will fail. And I'm here challenging you all today. Here's the steps we have to take. We have to recognize that God speaks first. He's talking. He's sharing his word through his word, through people, through your pastors, through loved ones, through the body of Christ, through podcasts, through music, through any of a number of methods. And then when we hear from him, we have to make the choice, is he our Lord? Because see, if he's your Lord, then you always obey your Lord. And then as a servant, we recognize that all I have to do 
is rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Listen for God to speak. Is he my Lord? Yes, I'm going to do what he says. And I'm going to continue listening so that I can obey the next time I hear from him. This process, which is so simple, which trips us up so greatly because many times we don't want to do what God says do. Why? Because it's a challenge. Because it's hard. Because it's everything we don't want. You don't find out if somebody's your Lord until you get to a place of they ask you to do something you don't want to do. Amen. Oh, it's easy to do something for anybody if you was going to do it anyway. When God calls you to places you don't want to go. When God calls you to give to people you don't want to give to. When he calls you to love on people that have treated you with everything except love. When he calls you to go into spaces that you're uncomfortable or to utilize giftings that you feel inadequate to use, but he says, I gave you that and I'm asking for you to serve me with it. He deserves everything that we have. I want to invite the prayer team to come on down here. Is there anybody in this room that will be honest with me and say, Pastor Jay, I need to do a better job of listening to obey God? Can you raise your hand if that's you? If you know, I, I got to do a better job. I love it. You can put your hands down. That's what this is about. Some of you, God has spoken clearly. You know what you're supposed to do. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. You know exactly what God has asked you to do specifically, and you refuse to do it. Do you know what the Bible calls that? To him who knows what is right to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. James 1. There's a whole lot of people that God isn't even counting sin against them. Oh, that's going to mess some of y'all real up. You're going to go to heaven one day and be confused about the folks you see up there and the ones you don't. How'd they make it in? And Jesus would be like, they didn't even know half the stuff they was doing was wrong, so I didn't count them against them. How so-and-so didn't make it? Oh, they knew everything in the Bible. Everything they did counted. God holds us accountable as we learn, as we know, as we understand. And that level of understanding is different for every person, which is why I thank God he judges the heart and that he is a righteous judge. So today I'm calling you, I'm challenging you. Let's obey our Lord. Let's be good servants. Let's listen to obey. Let's put aside our feelings. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what you want to do. It's not about the direction you want to go in. When I say he's my Lord, that implies ownership. He owns me. Amen. My will, not, that has nothing to do with it. It is his will only. Amen. I love the fact that Jesus showed us that. God, if there's any way possible, take this cup from me. I don't want to do it. This is going to hurt too much. I don't. I don't desire to die tomorrow, especially not the way that is your will for me to die. But he said, nevertheless, your will, not mine.